Mirlist, with eight generations of winemaking, is arguably South Africa's most historical estate. Producing one of the country's first Bordeaux blends, the Rubicon is an icon locally and internationally. Produced with incredible consistency and elegance, and with the ability to age for decades. Strauss & Co are delighted to offer our selection of 55 lots of Mirlist, most of them coming from the producer's cellars, as part of our April live sale, along with modern legends Molyneux and the Turin estate. While Giorgio Dallaccia and Chris Williams were the winemakers at this property for the last four decades, the big news is that Vim Trita has recently joined the team here as winemaker. Vim, what has attracted you to this property and um, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, relatively traditional start, studied winemaking in Stellenbosch. Was privileged enough to be able to travel overseas a bit, did a couple of vintage internationally. The main, obviously, attraction from a winemaking point of view is being involved on a farm from a holistic point of view, where it's all the way from vineyard development, deciding on what we're planting, how, how we're working for towards the future, looking at sort of farming techniques, trellising, all the way into the winery, how we shape the final style. Mirlis Estate is certainly one of the jewels in the Stellenbosch crown, uh, very close to False Bay. What attracted you to this terroir? What's attractive for me on the farm, especially now for, for future development, is that there's very distinct terroirs on the farm itself. You know, we've got this beautiful um, sort of hill at the back of the farm on, on the granite, um, really beautifully decomposed, um, all the way next to the river, the clays, across from where the, the, the homestead is, sort of more gravelly type soils. There's also this wonderful opportunity to find within the context of the mirrorless terroir, you know, where the best suited spot is for the Merlot, the Petit Verdot. Um, and then of course we still have, we have the, the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay that uh, obviously plays a very important role for us as well. Tom, is there any exciting news to share with regards of uh, new developments or uh, investments in the vineyard or in the cellar with regards to going forward? Innovation is always going to be you know, a, a driving force and it's going to be key, but with an historic estate that's sometimes a little bit tricky. Yes. So I think a lot of the focus for us is a lot of precision viticulture and there's some beautiful spots that, that's coming up for, for planting that I'm really excited about. With such long-term vision, it's no surprise that uh, these wines are so ageable. Mm -hmm. The recent sort of highlight vintages, one would say, is perhaps 2015 and 2017. What would be, in your opinion, the, the best sort of ageing window or, or drinking window for these sort of good vintages from your list? I think the wines show beautifully in their youth, in terms of the dark fruit and the concentration. But, but only after really, I think, 10 years, you really start seeing the pedigree. We were blown away by the 1980s. This was certainly one of the highlights. This is a 41-year-old Cabernet Sauvignon and it still shows a lot of life and poise and, uh, and purity. Uh, what was your thoughts on the 1980s? The thing that stands out is just how much life is still left in it. Um, there's still this beautiful, delicate tannin. I think also something for me that's really a standout is to be able to have the opportunity to buy the full vertical of say 12 vintages of Rubicon. And to be able to experience you know, the the bit of vintage variation where you essentially had the same hands and the same farm guys making the wine, tending to the vines, yes. and how that expression has changed uh, over the vintages and, and how those wines are aging. It's really, a, it's really a unique opportunity. 